Hello, uh, anyone who's joining us on the live stream, thank you very much. I'm Joshua Ryan Sahar, and uh, I'm here today with Alex Bainbridge, the CEO from Autora, to talk about our future travel narrative. This is our first um, webinar where we're dissecting our series of 17 stories of the future of travel. And um, uh, we're delighted to have you watching this. So um, first of all, uh, Alex, do you want to quickly introduce yourself and then I'll do the same for myself? Yeah. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alex Bainbridge and I'm the CEO of Tora. And what we do is we deliver tourism and hospitality experiences using autonomous vehicles, which is fundamentally the story that we're all about to go through with this first narrative. Yep, thanks so much. And a very interesting narrative. I don't think I have anyone other than you to talk about this one. Um, a little bit from me. I'm Josh. I'm the director of Travel Tech uh, for Scotland. It's part of the Edinburgh Futures Institute. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've been running a series of workshops with now probably over 200 experts in the field of tourism, travel, hospitality or technology, or the intersection of them both. Uh, and those workshops, what we've tried to do is explore potential futures. So we have three sets of cards. One looks at the weight of the past. What is tourism like in the past? Though some of these cards look at present trends or economic uh, circumstances. And then the final set of cards look at potential futures, technologies that are being envisaged or, or, or different things that have been predicted. And with that, we have these sessions and we try and come up with interesting future narratives. Um, what we then did was we actually put it into an AI system and said, okay, turn it into something that is vaguely, you know, they vaguely a decent narrative, but it wasn't good enough. So we actually uh, went to illustrators, human illustrators, and a human copywriter to turn them into an interesting set of stories. And like I said, right at the start, we've got about 17, and this is our first one. Our first one is AR bubble transport. So before I delve into a quick summary, Alex, what was your thought, were your initial thought? Did you like it? Was it an entertaining read? I love it. Um, I mean, there's obviously a difference between what is a new form of transport and what is a new form of tourism. I think that this is, you know, we're, we're obviously going to have autonomous vehicles in the next few years. The real question is, will they be owned by people? Will they be owned by, can, uh, will they be owned by local tour companies or will they be owned by shared mobility platforms? So I love it, but I was also thinking, hang on, what, what's the commercial product here that a local tour operator could be operating? So I was, I was like, yeah, this is absolutely on point for where the tech is going, but it's not necessarily where the commercial tour operators are going. Mm, well, I think that's definitely something worth getting into. Um, let me give a quick synopsis for those who haven't read it. If you have not read it and want to, then you can go to the Travel Tech website and find it. And we'll link it into the notes on this as well. Uh, so Alex, you have to uh, bear with me as I just give the very quick introduction to AR Bubble Transport. So essentially, it is a story about the Robertson family. We're a family from Aberdeen, and uh, it's a multi-generational family. Um, the main character, I would say, is someone called Grandpat, the matriarch, the grandma. Uh, and she has a fun but sometimes tense relationship with her great, uh, sorry, her granddaughter, Kira. Now, they come from Aberdeen, but they're on their way for a family reunion in Stirling with their elderly cousin, Celia. So Grandpat really wants to go back to where she was born, the city of Stirling. Now, the main thing part of this is how do they help someone who's a little bit elderly go back to the place they were li living originally um, in a way that is fully immersive to really explore it so access um, with um, sustainable useful transport but also to really enjoy the experience um, and what happens is Kira books uh, the bubble transport the thing called the golf bubble line and I think your questions Alex on how that actually operates the model is very interesting and in this golf bubble transport they travel around Sterling uh, with this sort of huge glass dome windows that has sort of AR components where they're able to explore characters from history I think at one point they're able to witness William Wallace cutting back the English forces um, and a range of other sort of elements of the history of Sterling, including Vikings and so on. Uh, and the sort of crux of the story is they have a great time. Um, it's 
kind of magical. It's a magical experience, but they don't need to do much. Kira, I saw Karen, the mother in the family, can do a little bit of work while everyone's ob observing it. No one's having to drive it. Um, and it allows for this wonderful space for this family reunion to take place. So that's the story. That's the story. I think it's a really interesting one. Um, I think it was probably gone through quite a lot of iterations since the original workshop in Sterling. Um, so I guess from your perspective, Alex, from your business, um, what are the technologies and trends that you're aware of that you think might make this plausible or interesting? What are you doing in this space? Yeah, well, I, I think it's it's absolutely plausible. So I do expect consumers to get into an autonomous vehicle and take a tourism experience. But there are two key points that are fundamentally different to how I think it will work versus how this vision that, that's been described in the narrative. Um, the first is that people will likely bring their own devices. So the AR equipment will be like the sort of the Apple kit, uh, which is now purchased. If you, as a consumer, you can go and buy that for you know a few thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. um, so you could bring your own kit. So what is the advantage of hiring kit for three hours? Maybe if you're a tourist and you don't have the kit, I get it. Um, but I think bring your own kit. And of course, so therefore, if consumers do bring their own kit, why do they need to go in a dedicated tourism vehicle when they when there's going to be publicly available autonomous vehicles provided as part of uh, sort of local or regional uh, mobility solutions? So at, at, at which point, if you're a local tour bus company and you're sitting there thinking, OK, I'm going to transition to autonomous vehicles, you're thinking, well, hang on, I've now got to also compete with bring your own device and I've also got to compete with uh, local mobility platforms and consumers who have bought their own devices and are getting onto the local bus. And that that's how I see it slightly different, is that I'm, 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 I love the tech vision, but I'm struggling with the commercials. Yes, yeah. And um, can I ask you a couple of follow-on questions then? One is almost, um, one of the key features of the story is the, the design, right? It's, yep. uh, it's this huge bubble. I mean, the whole name of it is about this bubble. Um, and then these different features of this bubble. So there's like the, the AR elements and various things like that. So my two questions are, one is um, within the business models that you've sort of described, do you think it will ever come to reality where we have these uniquely designed spherical, all you can see um, vehicles? Yes. Um, the second is how, how do you envisage the experience within these vehicles as well? And what are you doing now to try and help this sort of thing come to life? Yeah, the, so so the fundamental question really is about size of the vehicle. That is the key thing. Um, historically, the reason why we have large tour buses today, 30, 40, 50 people, is because it makes it economic to operate a tour experience with one driver if you've got 30 paying customers. Mm. Um, soon as you take the pay uh, the driver out of the vehicle, you no longer need to be so economically efficient in terms of having large vehicles. So the majority of autonomous vehicles that are uh, coming into, uh, in, into action now are four, five, or six seats. Mm. So you need to think about this as you traveling with your family, which this example is, but the actual diagram showed quite a large vehicle. And mm. I think the more likelihood is that you're going to end up with these smaller vehicles, four, five, six people which means that you can be, have a totally personalized experience because that family is going to be in one vehicle and another family is going to be in another in, in a separate vehicle. So, that, so, so it means that the experiences can be completely personalized. An example of this, and perhaps this may not be a great example, but if you know that someone grew up in Sterling or has got ancestors in Sterling, you would drive to where they maybe were born, which you've got from the birth records, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting to that one family. But if there was a second family in the same vehicle, it'd be like, what am I doing here? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the ability to personalize is is a direct result of having a smaller vehicle, and I think that that is um, that that's that's something slightly different. If you another one is if you have, um, I mean, I, I kind of think of the vehicles as the glue rather than necessarily the experience itself. So with this with this drawing, it was very much vehicle 
as the experience and i'm like no the experience is you're in the vehicle and you're going to the museum or you're going to the restaurant or you're going to a, a location that's got impact with uh, resonance within the story um so i'm not so i think of autonomous vehicles primarily as the glue rather than mm. the experience uh, and, and this i think it's the autonomous vehicle as the experience which there has to be some opportunity to do but i'm not sure it's the major opportunity so. yeah and no, i also think that perhaps you can imagine something like that working especially when i think about a scottish context yeah. across a larger a larger journey whereas a city tour in this way perhaps feels perhaps it would be more of a stop off here get off experience it um as well I, yeah i mean i think i think there's going to be a variety of different models so for example we operate a, a night out product where you go from the hotel to the restaurant to the theater back to your hotel um and we don't really have that scaled up but you know that's something we're testing at the moment where and the and that night out product is all about logistics it's all about making sure that the customer gets to the restaurant on time and they leave the restaurant on time because the theater starts at 8 p.m. and it doesn't it's not moving <laughs> it's that's you've got to be there by a certain time you've got to be there by 7:45 um so how do you make the logistics of the evening work and it's mm. not about storytelling it's about logistics so in a in an urban uh tourism and hospitality use case it's about logistics uh but you are right there are these opportunities to have these kind of storytelling over eight hour kind of you know products um and and i think that you know which is i think which is where this narrative is focused so it's yeah, yeah. you've got to you've got to think of it as two types of two solutions storytelling logistics some some experiences are focused on logistics and some experiences are focused on storytelling and um mm. they're not quite the same and of course you know, it's probably a good moment to talk a little bit more about Autora because you are working in both of those. You're working in storytelling. And um, I, 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 we've spoken before about this. And one of the things which everyone is talking about is obviously the accessibility to new AI tools. So yep. can you tell us a little bit more about how you're approaching this sort of storytelling autonomy? Well, the, the first thing you need is the character. So you need something to front the experience. And we, we, we need that because as a result of having a voice user interface, you are going to have a, a voice that means something to people. You're going to hear them. So therefore, you may as well make them into a character. So in Scotland, one of the characters that we're experimenting with at the moment is Heather the Highland Cow. Uh, and so to take an experience with Heather as the AI tour guide. Um, but a character can also be um, historical. So if you want to pull out a particular character from from known history you can do that too um i've personally found the characters that are um not historical are kind of fictitious they're the most interesting i'm sad to say to any historian mm -hmm. listening um because heather the highland cow is you can make very charismatic and it doesn't really matter because it's just a highland cow right whereas <laughs> um whereas when you're doing a historical character sure you're talking to the character but are they really a fun person to be a tour guide? I mean, you know, so do you, I mean, we've got a character, Aristotle, and everyone's got an Aristotle on their AI platforms because uh, in 1985, Steve Jobs made a big prediction about Aristotle as your tour guide. Uh, so, of course, everyone who's in, in this AI tourism game has got Aristotle somewhere. Um, so we've got Aristotle, and Aristotle, oh, you know, works as a tech demo, but there's no way you'd want a Aristotle as a as your tour guide right mm -hmm. um because it just doesn't make any sense um so you know, maybe maybe some very slim context it would make sense but mostly you don't want aristotle as your tour guide um so i think that so so we've been really interested in getting these characters to be very charismatic and and how do you interact with them and then we operate those experiences within autonomous vehicles but also outside of autonomous vehicles so they they, they live in your phone fundamentally Mm -hmm. and um and and we can deliver all sorts of immersive experiences we can deliver uh, very logistical experiences so for example in san francisco you can get an autonomous car and you go on an ice cream tour and you go to three or four different ice cream shops mm -hmm. or in the uk you can have miss money penny operating a james bond immersive experience you know where you actually take the character of james bond um and miss money penny talks to you as if you're james bond uh you know so whatever it is you can you can do it um 
I think I'd like a combination of those two, actually. Yeah, well, well, that's it. I mean, I think, well, maybe James must mind if I didn't even take you on an ice cream tour. But uh, it, it is a, it, it, in the end, putting a character as your, um, I mean, a lot of destinations have characters already within their destination marketing. So you have a Highland cow or, mm. um, uh, you, you know, you have you have some someone someone historical that is relevant to the destination. So, yeah. so a lot of destination marketing is character led. The, the the difference is is that we now make these characters come alive, and you can interact with the characters, um, and you can ask them questions, and they'll 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 come back with answers. Can can I ask you about how you're doing it? Because obviously you've got an access to access to a lot more um, open source tools around the AI. Um, yeah. So the technical component, but there's as you've already hinted at, quite a substantial creative component there. And uh, yeah, I imagine this is a this has to be a collaborative effort. Well, absolutely. So we're an open platform to a point. Um, what I mean by that is that we want local tour companies and destinations to be using our tech. Uh, to work in their destinations, so we do everything we do is in other people's brands and other people's characters, um, and that's super important. So, the, the the closest model probably is YouTube, where if you upload a video to YouTube, when you as a consumer watch it, you know you're watching it on YouTube, but the reason you're watching it is the creator who published the video. Um, so that's the same with us. Uh, we're we're kind of a platform like that. Um, we're not completely there yet. Um, we're, we're slightly <laughs> overloaded with various different problems and solutions that we've got to put into place that we know about. Um, so it's not, you know, this is not a straightforward thing. Anyone who thinks you can just build an AI tool guide uh, has another thing coming. Um, it's the, the amount of work is somewhat endless. But uh, I've been down this path before. My previous business, uh, which I formed in 2003, was a reservation technology platform for local tour companies. And mm. And that took, um, you know, that took until 2008 and 2012 until we'd really just sorted ourselves out and got a product that was working at scale. Uh, and and that's the same with AI tour guides. You have to build it and you have to keep keep addressing problems. And you know, it's it's a it's a it's a really difficult problem because fundamentally, tour guides, human tour guides, do a great job <laughs> at delivering experiences and reacting to change. Um, AI tour guides you have to you have to program it to make yeah. to make it do these things you know and of course there's a whole geospatial element you know where are you there's signal and access i mean um i you know i've used a lot of these ai tools like character.ai is really interesting and all this sort of stuff but the complexity of building these in a way that's safe as well you know these these are the challenges that uh that are on everyone's mind well, it's 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 scenarios like you know, can you miss this ferry because there will be another ferry afterwards? Or if you if you don't miss, you know, if actually how urgent is it to not miss this ferry? Um, because yeah. you know, if you were a human tour guide and you were about to miss a ferry, you would cut the tour short so that you got on the ferry with your group, right? You're yeah. like, hey, everyone, uh, we're sorry, but we're going to get on this ferry now. We've just got to go. Whereas an AI tour guide is like, oh yeah, yeah, what are we going to do? Oh, oh god, we missed the ferry. Um, you know, so, <laughs> so so you have to. It's all of those little problems, and of course, these problems are significant if you miss a ferry, and there is another, in, and there isn't another ferry that day. So 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 all of a sudden, you've got to connect to ferry availability platforms so that you know exactly that the ferry's running. Blah 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 blah. You know, um, it's you know, it things that humans can do are quite straightforward, but actually that you know, building this into AI is. Is actually ninety five percent not an AI problem. It's a yeah. It sounds like a data problem. A data. It is a data problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a there's a couple of things in the story we probably haven't touched upon, which I think would be useful to almost dig into as well. I mean, uh, one of them, probably in more detail, is is that is that AR element to this? So the screen element. It was really interesting to me that we've chosen this story to start with because I think it was in one of the consumer electronics shows at the start of this year, there was a television that went um, transparent. So it was actually yeah. glass and then it was a television again. And um, I guess what's being alluded to in this story is almost that the windows of the bubble can turn into a augmented experience that you show the outside almost as glass, but with characters operating yeah. within it. And so it feels like it's far away, but potentially... I mean, that, that's been done a few years ago. Um, 
with a school bus in America where they made uh, they made a field trip to Mars. So if you if you anyone Google's uh, other search engines are available, but if anyone Google's uh, field trip to Mars, um, you will see from six seven years ago um, a a US school bus converted to having screens on all the windows. So all the kids are in the back of the bus thinking that they're driving along, and they're on a field trip in in Mars. So this has been done. Um, you know. Mm. You know that's fine. the The fundamental question, though, is that's expensive. Um, mm. You know, is is it better to have augmented reality attached to the human or attached to the windows of the vehicle? Um, and mm. I think attached to the human probably is the model to go. But they have to get a bit smaller than what Apple's got today. But yeah, which yeah. is true. I mean, it's an incredible tool that whole new Apple release, and yeah. it's um, it's uh, it's something that I think is. Yeah, potentially quite impactful. Um, but I mean, but the, the, the real the real thing though, the real problem that local tour companies have got. Let's say you're a tour bus company, is that you have to do something that a consumer can't do by themselves. Mm. Now, if if augmented reality devices become so popular that they're built into every phone or every pair of glasses. Um, what is it that the tour company can do? All they can end up doing is becoming a content creator for these devices. Well, are local tour companies the best entities to be turning into content creators? Probably not. It probably is the big online travel agent platforms or, you know, mm -hmm. Apple or whoever it is. It doesn't, or, you know, film people or whatever it is. It, it influences maybe as well. But it doesn't necessarily mean that tour operators are the best entity to be creating content. So the question for tour bus owners is, you can see all this happening, but what exactly do you do? And it, mm -hmm. it is, you know, there, there are definitely no straightforward answers. However, uh, it's definitely not do nothing. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think um, there's there's another aspect to both the story and also what you just said, which is about what makes a good experience on a tour, right? So, yeah. and often when we talk about automation and AI, um, you know, they may be a loser, and I think one of those in this scenario is perhaps the driver, who is often not just the driver, is perhaps she or he is the person who is guiding them around, providing context, providing warmth. The second component to this. I think is connection and you know the whole story is trying to say how this technology both inspires creates awe but allows for a genuine reunion of people and i guess that's why they've not got individual headsets um so where do you feel well there the is definitely the in, the, in the in the um picture i can see there are definitely people who are wearing headphones and in the circular picture in the middle, there is definitely people wearing headsets. So they don't mm. look very connect. They don't look very connected to their family. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, I don't know. Uh, I think that connection doesn't necessarily come from being in the same vicinity. Connection comes from achieving tasks together. Mm. So, um, I'm I'm not completely uh, convinced that just putting people in a bus and giving them all individual headsets is really a, solving anything. Uh, <laughs> but it is <laughs> as a product, as a commercial product. I mean, you know, it will absolutely happen, but it won't be having connection as the outcome of that. I mean, you know, it will just be here's yeah. an afternoon. It's nice. Um, so yeah, I, I think what 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 I thought was a bit amusing though about tech was uh, was this uh, picture of the um, the cafe at the end, which was described to have as having a no tech policy. Well, mm. I, I I'm like, oh, okay, that's going to be interesting. If we will, people do that. I mean, I personally think the cafe is where the tech is tech is fundamentally because firstly you've got a human waitress. Well, that would be a robot, um, and secondly where you've got um where you've got food uh, actually tech can be super helpful because it can understand your allergies it can understand your food preferences and give everyone a personalized outcome mm -hmm. so i think i think food is food and and hospitality will absolutely change as a result of all this tech much faster than the autonomous bus 
So mm. I'm, I, I'm I'm looking at that last diagram and I'm thinking, hang on, I think this is, this might be the way, the wrong way around, uh, which is I yeah. think you have a tech restaurant, but you might have a non-tech bus. Yeah, that's interesting. I think um, I agree with you in one bit, and I think I disagree with you on another about the restaurant. One is I think that um, the back office processes, the ability to personalize mm. uh, and automate aspects of a cooking process absolutely and i can see and you know you, you can go into any small business and they would they could benefit from off-the-shelf robotic process tools or even some of the ai tools that are a little bit easier to create but i think i think the probably the best way to do that is to then use that to prioritize that interpersonal connection you have with yep. um, the staff you know I, I think that's what i like about an experience often uh, depending what type of level it is and what type of restaurant it is of course but but I think it frees people, it frees the human staff up to provide better service because they're not yes, yeah. they're not focused on getting the right piece of cake to the right person. <laughs> they're, they're they're able to become spend five minutes being a storyteller about how this cake, the history of the cake, and why it was so yeah, cool, yeah. and, you know why you should be eating it. So so all of a sudden we're you know we're sort of up upscaling the the restaurant experience using tech, but. but but we've removed some elements of of service as a result of tech, but we've actually added new things back in. I mean, this is where the big argument about job losses as a result of AI comes in. No, yes, there will be job losses, but there will be job creation too. So it's a matter of understanding, yeah. you know, where it is and, and, and uh, you know, you know how, how you balance that. So yeah, and I hope it's I a hope. shift. It's a shift. Yeah, I mean, I always hope with travel hospitality that the shift is towards allowing for that the use of AI and productivity technology tools to allow for actually more people to work into in the industry, doing the things they want to do, rather than doing the the mundane copying and pasting. Uh, so, how how many robots do you have in your house? Well, I don't know. Um, more than I perhaps uh, think. Uh, I have a couple of speakers. Oh, speakers. Uh, okay. okay. So do you yeah. have a washing machine? Well, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, 100 years ago, you would have had a maid. Um, and of course, that is now you, you now have a robot in your house rather than a maid. Um, oh, we lost you. Uh, oh, lost, lost the stream. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone can hear me. Hello? Oh. I'm so sorry. I lost you for a second there. No, I lost you. Uh, anyway, there we are. I don't know. If, uh, so I'll say it again. So 100 years ago, you would have had a maid, and now you've got a washing machine. Um, and that is the transition. Are you sitting there in your home going, gosh, I wish I had this. I wish I still had a maid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this is fundamentally the, this is fundamentally the shifts that are happening. Now, these shifts will happen, and you, know, you, you just have to get on with it and realize that that's how it's going to be. Yeah. Well, any final thoughts, anything you'd like to share with anyone who's watching the video? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 my last thought is that the thing about autonomous vehicles, let's bring it back to that, is that if you are a tour bus owner today, whether or not that's a, a 30, 40, 50 seater or it's a 15 seater minibus or a 10 seater minibus, these vehicles, these autonomous vehicles are coming. Um, so we, my business is already operating 30 experiences using autonomous vehicles, uh, mostly in America. So this is this is here and happening. If you buy tour buses, you generally expect to use them for 15 years. So any new vehicle you purchase today in 2024, you're going to expect to use until 2039, let's say. Now, so, so if autonomous vehicles are everywhere in 2030, any vehicle you buy today may only get six years commercial use. That fundamentally is a question for every company who is buying tour buses or minibuses on finance is, are you going to be able to commercially repay that if the product that consumers expect changes mm -hmm. as a result of um autonomous vehicles because the biggest thing that i think will happen and i expect this around 2030 maybe 2028 in some countries so let's call it 2030 um, i expect that there will be personally owned autonomous vehicles now a personally owned autonomous vehicle 
means that a consumer will be able to go to a car rental company like Hertz and hire an autonomous car for five hours. And as soon as they can hire an autonomous car for five hours as a tourist, they can do any tourism experience in the destination. Mm. They do not need a dedicated tourism vehicle. They will just go to Hertz and rent a car for five hours. That is what the tour bus companies are going to be competing against in the coming years. And in particular, in destinations like Scotland, where quite a lot of places require driving between, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the ability when, when consumers have that capability to, to rent, not just for five hours, but for two days. <laughs> you, what is the tour bus? What is the role of a tour bus at that point? And you know, so if if you are a tour bus company and you are highly financed on buying buses that you expect to get fifteen or ten years use out of, this has to be top of your list of concerns that you need to be thinking about or hedging, uh, because this this is coming and those vehicles will be available from car rental companies. So it's not even your local tour operator competitors that you need to worry about now. It's the car rental companies and all these other companies. Um, so you don't need to. You know, you're not sitting there going, well, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to do it because this, the other tour companies are not doing it. Well, we're fine. But your competitors are not your, you know, they're not the tour companies. That, that's not that's mm. not who you're going to be competing with in five years time. So autonomy is coming. This story perhaps isn't an accurate description of the future, well, nor is it intended to be. But so so over, over the last nine years, there's been um, there's a, been a report came out last week said 42 billion dollars of money has been invested into autonomous vehicles research over the last uh, nine years 42 billion i can tell you that's 42 billion more than tourism companies invested in it so um so that money has now been invested sure as any good investor will say that's a bit of a sunk cost but they th those investors are expecting to get their money back at some point um and they will do that and nearly every single thing that these companies talk about, whenever they talk about it, is they talk about experience. Okay, they don't talk about tourism and they don't talk about hospitality, but they say experience. Mm. And they want these vehicle experiences to be amazing. And whenever they've got presentations, they always they always sort of you know put in a tourism example of driving around and having a, a character in the vehicle giving you tourism information. I'm like, yeah, okay, so 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 this is top of their mind of things that they're going to be doing. So I would say, hey, tour bus companies, you need, you need to be thinking about this. But the, the counter, of course, is that if you're a local tour company or hotel and you don't have any tour buses, you'll be like, I don't need any tour buses because in a few years' time, our consumers will be able to go to Hertz and rent a car for five hours and we can put our tourism experiences into doing, publicly available yeah. vehicles. So what might be seen as a, a negative problem for the tour bus operators is actually a positive for everyone else because now the hotel can go, oh, I can invent an experience that starts and ends at the hotel and I don't even need to have any capital investment. I can just use the local car hire company vehicles. And make those connections there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, such an interesting end, I think, to this, which is that change is coming, you know, just those signals of a huge amount of investment and the, the way that they are talking about their experience means that, you know, when I think about this story, it feels like elements of this uh, grounded in, in a potential future, right? Well, I mean, uh, the thing is, autonomous vehicles are, are fairly well baked in because they're coming, they're here already in America and China, China's very, very mm. far ahead. Um, so, so the argument of whether or not they're coming or not that argument has gone. There is still a timeline argument, um, which is fine. Uh, but I, I, you know, that. But we're talking about twenty thirty here, rather than you know whatever. Um, so let's if we keep going on the twenty thirty track, it will be here by then. But going back to my other point about financing, if you've bought a tour bus and you're expecting 10, 15 years use from your tour bus when you bought it, and these things are here in five, four, five, six, you've got a problem on your financing. So even 20, 30 timelines should be sending a few shockwaves around uh, the you know vehicle owners. So yeah, mm. this the vehicles are coming. Um, uh, augmented reality is here with Apple um, and, and Facebook Meta. Um, it's it you know it's all it's all coming together 
um and, yeah. and the, the yeah. fundamental is what do you do as a consumer uh, you're going to just use whatever tech you want to use so what do you do as a tour operator you have to be staying ahead of what the consumer wants but the problem is is that it's now apple and microsoft and amazon yeah. that they're ahead of and that's not so that's not something you can do by yourself as a local tour operator so. no no certainly not not many no not not many governments can perhaps so i think as a tour operator it is it's particularly you have to work with what, what's out there now i think we've come to the end of time so first of all just thank you so much first of all for for diving into that story picking it apart and giving you giving your thoughts on it um to anyone who's watching the video Get onto the Travel Tech website, read the story, but also get onto Autora, see what they're doing, uh, get in touch with you, Alex, because I think, you know, one thing which sticks in my mind is doing a lot of this in the US. We need to do more of it in the UK. We need to do more of it in Scotland. We need to do more of it in Europe because, you know, uh, if you're doing it in the US, the expectations of US visitors will change when they come here. So, Oh, yeah. that's totally true. Uh, but also, also, you don't need to wait for autonomous vehicles. The majority of the tech that you can see in this in this narrative is going to is available now outside of autonomous vehicles um and, and therefore you don't need to be sitting there thinking oh let's just wait for autonomous vehicles it's something especially if you're a tour bus company you need to act now because you need to get some learnings in place so that you can start making decisions because if you don't make if, if you don't spend the next couple of years learning about what being a digital tour operator is by the time you get to 2026 and you're going oh i've got to make some decisions now you're going to have zero knowledge of what works in your market and you are going to have no capability to make good decisions whereas mm -hmm. if you just tip dip your toe in the water now by it comes time 2026 you will have two seasons worth of trading and you'll be like oh yeah then make you know I, I know what's going to work in my destination now yeah yeah so that's a very sound and sage advice to end on thank you so much for joining us for our first discussion about the future travel narratives and uh, we will have another one next week. We're going to talk about our story, but we're going to launch tomorrow. So thank you so much, Alex. And uh, yeah, look forward to carrying on this conversation. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>